For those of you who are new to Ned Talks, it is just a, a super relaxed platform for discussion. What we try and do is pick topics that are relevant to advisors that look after private clients. Um, quite a vast range. Uh, um, the topic we've got today actually is a, is a particular favorite of mine. Um, uh, which we, 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 we did an event actually on the topic, on the research project that, that, that Russ is part of last year. Couldn't, hadn't quite realized that it would create or, or build sort of the, the emotions, uh, relief, frustration uh, um, that, that came across from, from the different attendees. But um, yeah, it was really interesting. And, and what it just confirmed is that this is a really important topic for those families, for those advisors and even connected. Now, I won't steal any more thunder, but in terms of the, the topics today, we're going to go through what is the quest for legitimacy, because uh, there is quite a few people on here that maybe haven't heard of it. Uh, and then looking at why it is so important, the language and the experiences of those people affected. And then we're going to look at some of the practical things that Russ and, and, and his, his team have been doing globally um, and, and, and what is next for Quest. So Russ, can you can you just give up just a brief introduction to yourself and also then go into what Quest is? Absolutely. So uh, morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> there's a few... Uh, strings to my bow um, in terms of the work that I do. So as Andy mentioned, I'm predominantly a family business advisor, um, previously worked in the world of financial planning and uh, wealth management. Uh, great to see Karen on the call. Uh, we go back uh, a while, so great to see you, Karen. Um, I um, moved into the world of family business advising about eight years ago, um, and part of that transition involved me launching a podcast uh, which is imaginatively titled the family business podcast and through that i got introduced to a psychologist based in chicago uh, by the name of dr jamie weiner he needed somebody um this was pre-pandemic he needed somebody who had the technical ability to press record on zoom and because it is still relatively new at that time, uh, I was able to use that unique skill um, to uh, find myself part of a research team. And the topic of the research was to explore the lived experience of those that grow up in prominent families. Now, we use the terminology prominence very clearly as opposed to wealthy, although a lot of the families that we spoke to were very wealthy the focus that we placed on it was much more around the prominence that can exist uh, when you grow up in that uh, environment. To, to give you a, uh, an example of that, one of the people we spoke with was the grandson of the guy who built the Hoover Dam. And so if you imagine growing up in that environment and thinking, what can I do that's going to live up to the achievements of my um, predecessors? because even if he builds another Hoover Dam, it's still the second one, not the first one. So there was a lot of experiences that we heard um, throughout the research. We spoke with 25 rising gen from across the globe, and there was lots of similar patterns. <clears throat> Partway through the research, we picked up an academic research team from the University of Adelaide, um, they were able to sort of translate our transcripts and our recordings into data, which was able to confirm the existence of the patterns that we thought we had seen. And then my colleague um, has brilliantly captured those stories in the book you can see over each of my uh, shoulders, uh, which is called The Quest for Legitimacy. Um, and currently we are uh, developing a a coaching program to help support the rising gen. So that's a little bit about um, who I am and, and what the quest for legitimacy is. Was that brief enough, Andy? Yeah, no, that was great. Thank you. Um, sorry, yeah. And uh, no. in terms of, so what was the breadth of the research project that you did? How many families did you actually interview? And um, what were the findings? I suppose that's yeah, so t 25 Rising Gen, um, because of the timing, we managed to speak with them twice. So once was pre-pandemic, once was kind of during and, and just kind of post-pandemic. And it was interesting to hear their reflections on what they understood to be 
uh, their own experience, which helped inform some of the findings as well. So we started each of the interviews with the question of what, what is it like to grow up in the land of giants? And no one stopped us and said, well, what do you mean? Everybody understood that there was a giant in their life that was casting some form of shadow. Now, we subsequently um, labelled uh, this, uh, in some circumstances, the unintentional shadow, because oftentimes the giants don't realise that they're giants in the eyes of others. And so whilst they're casting this shadow, um, it's not necessarily something that's being deliberately done or deliberately trying to impose um, expectation onto uh, the rising gen. Um, but as I say, that was one of the uh, common elements was that there was this shadow being cast by um, the giants. Thanks. In terms of the findings, one of the key elements, which is part of the challenge we are now trying to solve, is a sense of isolation. So whilst there was common experiences, the rising gen weren't necessarily able to speak to others that were having that same experience. So they felt very isolated, and in particular in terms of relevance to, say, advisors, is they didn't feel as though that experience was understood by their advisors either. So in terms of the feeling of that isolation, the opportunity to talk to us about what it was that they were going through came as a very welcome tonic and led them to reflect a lot on their lives. And, and Russ, so just, just firsthand, when we did the, the dinner and we spoke and we had people that were those rising gen or, you know, the children, but they were you know, middle-aged, um, the, the, the relief that the, A, that they could talk about the hardships of being part of a prominent family and B, like you touched on, that the, the, there was a language that was very natural to them that they thought it was only they felt it and the relief that they could go, ah, oh, A, as they talk about it, and, and this all makes a lot of sense was 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 huge, actually. Yeah. And that, that's one of the beauties really of having the the research team because they were able to spot these phases that each of the participants were going through. Now they gave them very technical academic um, names. So I, I want to to paint a picture of, imagine a scene similar to the one we've got now on a, on a Zoom screen. It's 8.30 a.m. in Adelaide, it's 5 p.m. in Chicago, and it's midnight in the UK. So I'm sat there with matchsticks and a coffee, trying to understand all the academic terminology that has been thrown at me by an economic sociologist. So my first job was to Google what an economic sociologist was or is, um, then to try and understand all of the academic language that was coming out from those findings. Thankfully, we've been able to translate those into, as you say, this language that Rising Gen are able to relate to and resonate with. So if I just run through very quickly the four phases that we found people uh, went through, one key is to realise it's not a linear process. So it's not phase one, two, three, four, and then you get a certificate to say you're legitimate and, and off you go into life. Um, you can be at any one of these phases at any given point in your life. The first one is awareness. So it's an awareness that there is something different about your life to those um, outside of your kind of immediate circle. Um, best example we've got of this is one of the um, participants that we spoke with grew up in a jewelry making and diamond dealing family. And when she was very young, she was learned, uh, so she was taught to um, add up and count by using the diamonds that her father was able to bring home and pour on the table in front of her. And I don't know about you, but I didn't learn to count um, by counting diamonds out on uh, the kitchen table. And that was something that was an awareness that came to her after the event. For her growing up in that environment, all very normal. She was five, six years old. She's got no frame of reference outside of that existence, but retrospectively looking back, she was a, a, aware of things that were different in her childhood compared to those um, of her peers. And guys, just, just to say, these sessions, are, and it's going to be much easier for us as well, if you have any questions, please, please pipe up. It, hopefully, I, I recognise a lot of faces, now, quite a few of you, so you know it's a relaxed platform. Please blurt out any questions you have. There's no, I'm normally the ones that ask the stupid questions. I'd like a week off, that would be nice. Um, but yeah, so please, let's try and make this as interactive as possible and not just my voice asking Russ questions. Agreed. Um, 
No worries. Uh, so first first stage is, is awareness. Next says tug of war. So that was this feeling of being pulled between the world you grew up in and the world that existed outside of that. And often that was experienced around college time where you were kind of getting exposed to lots of different people uh, from various different backgrounds. And there was this pull of the in, uh, the world you'd kind of grown, grown up in um, and the, the outside world. We then move into the third phase, which is exploration. And this is possibly the most underutilized um, phase within the quest. But exploration is your opportunity to find your own identity, to really discover your purpose and the impact that you can have on the world, rather than it being dictated or governed by the kind of governance structures or wealth planning, tax planning structures that have been created around the success that the families have had. We're not saying that that work isn't important, but what we're saying is there's often an over-focus on learning how does money work, how do trust work, how do, if it's a family office, for example, how does that work? That's all very technical and, and logical, but much more focus could be placed on an exploration of their own identity, their own sense of purpose, rather than being defined by the success of their predecessors or the wealth that exists um, in their family. And then the final phase is that of ownership. We don't mean ownership of assets, we don't mean ownership of shares, but we mean a sense of agency over your own life. So taking ownership of your own life is that ability to know exactly who you are and, and the purpose that you serve. And one of the key findings was that there, firstly, there's a, a desire to give back to the institutions from which the rising gen came. So economic sociology uses the term institutions as being any group of individuals. So technically this morning, we're all an institution because we're all in the same place at the same time. Um, and there is a desire for all those rising gen to give back to the institutions they came from. And you're better prepared to do that when you have a sense of agency and you have a sense of ownership over your life. But that comes through lived experiences. It comes through learning how to navigate things called breaking moments, which again is something that was very common um, in the experiences of those that we spoke with. To give a quick example of what a breaking moment might be, we've all, we've all experienced one, um, that's COVID. So where life's going along and then all of a sudden something comes along and kind of knocks you for six. You're into a period of feeling a bit lost, a bit confused, um, the betwixt and between, uh, we call that liminality. And that was, again, something that was very common amongst all of those that we spoke with, with various breaking moments in their lives. Right, can you give some examples of actually the the breaking moments that they had specifically rather than a, sort of one we were all affected by? Sure, yeah, um, so one, again, sometimes looking back, they didn't realise there was a breaking moment at the time, but looking back it was. So there was a, uh, one guy whose family bonded and really came together around tennis. And when he was young, he broke his collarbone, which meant he couldn't play tennis. So that was the breaking moment for him that shifted the way his life went. And it led to a slight detachment from the family and the bonding exercises that they were doing around the love of tennis that they had. And it shifted the way that his life turned out. He, he decided he didn't want to go into the family enterprise. He wanted to live by the beach, surf and, and play his guitar. Um, he realized he needed a business in order to do that. So he set one up and it became very successful, but it changed the path of his life. Um, for others, it's marriages, can be deaths, can be divorce. The moments that come along that kind of um, alter the, the path you thought was there in front of you. Um, they don't also have to be negative, they can be positive. Um, birth of a child, again, is another example. Um, but those were the kind of things that we were seeing in the research. Okay, thanks guys. Um, now, obviously this has been uh, a big part of your life for, for quite some time, but you're actually starting to make some visits around the world because obviously this isn't, this is all the people you interviewed were, you know, global families and you just, uh, you're just back from a trip to Oz. What was that all about? Um, so what we're finding is having conversations like the conversations we were having throughout the research is not something that commonly happens in families of prominence or families of wealth. 
there's almost a, a misconception that a if you're feeling if you're rising gen in that situation you're feeling isolated you don't know to go and speak to other people about it and say hang on are you experiencing this as well because you feel isolated so it, you, you, it just doesn't work like that similarly in terms of advisors to families they tend to be focused on solving the challenge of how to pass wealth through generations how to pass um, enterprises through generations so that's based again very much in the f kind of governance frameworks and the, the tax and financial planning solutions what we're finding in with audiences across the globe is that when you start to talk about this it opens up a new understanding for your client um, scenarios the clients that you're working with so for clients it opens up the possibility to really understand their lived experience and how that impacts the advice that's being given. So we did um, did about two and a half weeks in uh, Australia visiting different conferences. So we did a family business focused conference uh, and we did a family office focused um, conference. We did a masterclass for each. And th that again highlighted to us the importance of having these types of conversations they're not being had and and that i do a bit of work in the states as well so in the us the uk and in australia there's a common theme that this isn't something that's readily being spoken about which is why we're passionate about spreading the um, news of the work that we're doing um, particularly around the contents of the book because it's such an important discussion to have with people um, and that was very much brought home by a uh, uh, little trip over the um, over to Australia. Little trip, yeah. Um, and, and in terms of the impact it has on how people can speak to their clients, just by having a, a little bit of this in their back pocket, can you sort of explain any feedback you've had from people that weren't aware of it, then were aware of it, and they've come back to you and said, "How has this impacted their relationship with the client?" Yeah, so again, I can I can kind of lean on my experience as a um, financial planner, but everything was dictated by fact find. Here's the questions you need to ask the clients in order to understand their situation, but none of that really delves into how do you feel about the expectations that are on you, either brought on by yourself or implied by the significance of your family because it will impact their relationship with everything that's in the world around them. So if there is significant wealth and the ambition is to ensure that that wealth is maintained through generations, having that lack of legitimacy will be impacted in the way that that advice is received. So it may leave them feeling, I can't ask questions about this because I don't feel legitimate enough to be able to go, hang on, I don't understand what a trust is or I don't understand how this structure works. And so deepening the relationship with the client by asking them about their experience, even if it's just going, how was that for you? Or how is it for you growing up in this prominent family or being part of this prominent family? Starts to increase that understanding. That There's also, I think, um, a bit of an assumption that if there is significant wealth, that there's no issues, there's no challenges. We know that not to be true. The the presence of uh, addiction, for example, in wealthy families is more prevalent than than otherwise. And so, being able to talk about it and to relate to them in a way that presents a language rather than a prejudgment, um, mm -hmm. we think is a really valuable uh, asset for an advisor to have because it is really trying to understand the lived experience of people rather than making our own assumptions of this must be a doddle living in wealth because everything's sold for you. Yeah, this is it. The first time that we spoke about the topic, I remember thinking this feels like the smallest violin play type thing because that, that's the instant reaction, isn't it? And then actually delve a bit deeper and it's very different. But that that was my first reaction was like, boohoo. Um, and that was a reaction of a lot of the, the older, the, the now generation at the dinner. They, I think one of them even said, dry your eyes the lady was actually crying um go and make some more money which can which you know that was the complete disconnect this with with, with the two different generations yeah we, we got a bit um told off on on uh that particular part of the the dinner but i think the important part of that is that 
none of this suggests there shouldn't be the creation of more wealth. We're not saying that growing up with wealth is a terrible experience. What we're saying is it comes with a unique set of challenges that if we can help people to navigate, more people are going to be able to live fulfilled lives. And that, that for me, is a, the, the impact that we can have. It's the ability to help people live more fulfilled lives. And by understanding their lived experience and having empathy with that and using the language that we've created through this project, it offers an opportunity to deepen those relationships with um, clients. Uh, particularly when we look at the, uh, again, it's a possibly overused statistic on how many uh, next gen leave their parents' advisors because they feel like they're the parents' advisors and they're being judged by, well, your parents wouldn't want you to do this. So by creating that relationship early on and understanding and having empathy for the experience that they're having helps to deepen that relationship as well. And that, that was something that was very key in the feedback we got from participants is generally speaking, they feel spoken at by advisors, not spoken with. And I think that there's there's loads of really great advisors that, that do this. So I'm not saying everyone's the same, but in terms of the feedback we received directly on that kind of topic is to be interested in us, not not what you think mum and dad would want us to do. Help, help us to understand uh, what it is we need to do as well. And also, not, not every not everyone is badly affected, uh, as as we found. You know, there were, the, the you have families that are very close and they don't seem to have the issues, and then you have the ones at the other end of the scale. So it's not. But I imagine everyone has an element of it. There's a. Um, it's just some. It, it has quite a negative outcome. Others, it's virtually non-existent. Yeah, the, uh, absolutely. It's not an in, it's not an inherently negative experience. We've got great examples of people who have really found and understood their purpose, but the the way they've got there could have been more efficient had they been made aware of um, these kind of uh, the language and the phases of the quest and how important it is to, to understand uh, ourselves. The, that would have made it more efficient. And again, that's what people have been saying to us is we wish we knew this existed when we were going through it because it would have made it easier for us to to navigate. But no, it's not an inherently negative experience. Very, very important to point that out. No, fine. So what's next? Because I know this was very much focused. I hope I'm not guiding you. Michael, no, that's actually changed. Um, very much focused on, um, on the next, the rising gen. Um, what's next for Quest? Um, so pro probably worth defining rising gen because ne next gen generally has an age bracket. So it's kind of some are 18 to 30, some are 18 to 40. Um, the, I kept expanding the age bracket to try and make myself feel younger um, so that I could claim as a next gen even though I'm in my 40s now. Um, but rising gen is much more accurate in terms of the kind of description because it's a mindset. And the the people that we tend to help most are those from their mid thirties onwards. Um, if you think about it in terms of our monarchy up until uh, last year, Prince Charles was the rising generation. He was in his seventies. One of the people that we spoke with was in their seventies and still having this kind of internal struggle of of how do I measure up? And so what we're doing to help those people is building out a program, so cohort-based program that incorporates uh, online um, coaching and then culminating in a uh, retreat experience where we do a deep dive and immersive experience on uh, understanding agency and the impact that you can have on the world and then following that up with accountability. We've all been to conferences or experiences where we go, that's amazing. I'm definitely going to change everything about my life when I get home and then Monday morning arrives and kicks you in the you know where and it's kind of back to reality and you forget about everything. So we want to help people stay accountable to the change that they want to see in their lives. And one of the important aspects of that is understanding that, so I'm, I work with family businesses that are systems, so I, that works a lot in systems theory. Oh, brilliant. And Thank you very much. Systems theory very often ignores the individual. 
Whereas a lot of individual coaching ignores that there's a system present as well. So it's getting the balance right between finding your own identity and impact whilst honouring and remaining part of those uh, institutions that you've come from, which is a delicate balance. So we're not advocating for everyone to ditch their families and go off and sell the world or whatever, but it's much more about how do you find your identity and the impact you want to have. Thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I have a question for us, but I'm conscious that um, we, we haven't heard anyone else's voice bar mine. Um, if, if anyone has a question or they have an experience or this is interesting because um, please pipe up, otherwise I will be asking the next one. Nobody wants that. Come on, come on, Sarah. I can see you've got a question. You haven't, no. <laughs> right, well, I'll go. Um, so everything's focused on the kids. What about the parents? Uh, sorry, uh, rising now generation. But in reality, that's the sort of split generally, or grandparents. Yeah, so what, one of the um, themes of the keynote we gave uh, in Australia was <laughs> around how do you build a bridge between generations through the lens of legitimacy? And if you think of the founders or the giants that you will have known um, in your own lives, they have all been on their own quest for legitimacy. They have all been in a position where they've made and learned from their mistakes. And that's how they build the grit and resilience to persevere and become a giant. So understanding that and, and humanizing their experience rather than, say, the rising gym placing them on a pedestal means that you're better able to navigate your own experience because you understand that there's been mistakes made by everyone. Nobody's gone through life with a manual of how to do it. And we're all kind of making it up as we go along every day. And the giants are just further ahead in that process. So what we're encouraging is more conversation and storytelling between generations of those difficult experiences of those times where things were really tough and you couldn't see a way through, but have now gone through that, sharing that with the next generation or rising generation to help humanize their experience is a great way for them to learn. Because again, if you imagine wealth's been created and there's been this, all this stuff created around it to protect it, that's normally to stop the rising germ from making any mistakes. And if they can't make mistakes, they can't learn, they can't evolve, they can't build that grit and resilience. So that storytelling and, and the humanization of that experience between the now and the rising generation is really important. Okay, well, Russ, I think that probably brings it to a close for half an hour. So thank you for rattling through what is a massive topic in a, a very Quickly. short space of time. Last chance for any questions? If not, it's a big thank you to Russ. And thank you everyone for joining us today as well. I really yeah, appreciate it. Um, and I'll be out soon with uh, next month's topic. Um, and I hope to see you all again soon. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You.